All right, y'all. Well, let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18. We are getting there. And so uh, go ahead, grab your Bibles, your notebooks, your pens. We're going to be actually talking about a theme from chapter 17 and chapter 18. As you're turning to chapter 18, we're going to be in verses 4 to 5 uh, today. And so as you're turning there, I want to remind us that the church are those who are united to Jesus Christ by the working of the Holy Spirit, that we together are called to be conformed to the image of Christ. And so we encourage one another, we challenge one another by the word of God, that we might be formed and conformed to the image of Christ. And so together as we gather, we continue to be centered and focused on the word, which means that hopefully uh, everything that we do everything that we hear on a weekend is not somebody's opinion, but is centered on the word of God. And so turning to Revelation chapter 18, verse 4 and 5 says this. It says, Then I heard another voice from heaven come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins or receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, today I hope to encourage us or challenge us from this Babylonian economics and kingdom economics. Babylonian economics and kingdom economics. I'd like to start by just acknowledging that the book of Revelation is a little intense. I don't know if anybody's like noticed that as we've been through this series, but it's been an intense series because it's a critique of the moment of the Roman Empire in the first century, but not only is it a critique of the Roman Empire, but it is a critique of any place, any nation, any people that Christians belong to, regardless of nationality, regardless of time, whether you are somebody living under the Roman Empire in the first century, the Mongolian Empire in the 13th century, or the American empire in the 21st century, uh, that we recognize that this is a critique, and it calls Christians at its core to live as Christians who follow in the way of the slaughtered lamb. And so today we're going to talk about Babylon. And as we walk through this series, what I recognize is there's two different ways that you can preach. One is called topical preaching. The other one is called expositional or expository preaching. And what that means is I can either go into scripture and I can kind of like pick the verses and references that I want to talk about and just be like, cool, I'm going to talk about this, but not about that one. But expositional preaching causes us to walk chapter by chapter through the Bible so that we are confronted with what the Bible has to say on issues that are uncomfortable, on issues that we don't particularly want to hear about, and it talks about it in ways that maybe we would rather it not, you know, like, can it be more like sunshine and rainbows and butterflies through the book of Revelation rather than bowls and trumpets and wrath, but that is the way that it is, and so don't worry, hold on, because chapters 21 and 22 uh, will get to some of the, the good part of Revelation that talks about the great things that are coming up, but until then, we walk through and ask ourselves the question, what are the similarities between the Christians in the first century living in Rome and us as Christians in the 21st century living, in our case, in America. And so first, let's talk a little bit about Babylon. So the the word Babylon actually means gate of the gods. And one of the first times that we see this idea of Babylon is actually in Genesis chapter 11, where we see something called the Tower of Babel. And the idea was that humanity was trying to create a space where they were able to uh, create a kind of a gateway to the gods. They were able to create a pathway to the gods as a means of controlling the gods around them. And so you see this idea of Babylon being a place of human hubris. We see Babylon being a place where we have pride, where we think that somehow we've achieved something. And not only that, but then we actually see that um, Babylon actually comes in in 587 B.C. and conquers the nation of Israel, and it destroys Jerusalem. And so you see not only Babylon under Babel being the place of hubris of the people, but we recognize that in uh, them overcoming Israel and the people of God, that we see that it's actually also a sign of oppression. We see this throughout the Old Testament prophets as they talk about Babylon being used to symbolize evil, being used to symbolize oppression. Uh, And it recognizes that many times when it talks about Babylon, that it's saying that the nation of Israel at that time, since they were in Babylonian exile, were seen as a group of people kind of without a land. They were people who were oppressed by those around them. And so they were living as exiles in the land. And so we see that throughout the Old Testament prophets. And then it's carried forward into the New 
New Testament toward this idea of human pride and hubris, toward the oppression of God's people, and toward all of the immorality that went with Babylon, uh, the places of war and killing and immorality. We see this idea so that one person talks about Babylon in this way. One commentator says, just as ancient Babylon had been the wicked and ruthless enemy of God's people in Old Testament times, so now the Roman Empire was the enemy of Christians. The passage thus symbolizes the rapacious and violent nature of the imperial power sought by many earthly kingdoms. Nations have continued to satiate the relentless appetite for secular power. Just as the early Christians celebrated the downfall of Rome, so every generation of believers waits expectantly for the end of oppressive world empires. And so as we look at the history of Babylon throughout the Bible, what we recognize, it's a place of pride, it's a place of oppression, and it is a place of evil, where good is called evil and evil is called good. And that means as we come to the end of chapter 17, it says this in verse 18 about the woman. You saw this, uh, and the woman you saw is the great city that has royal power over the king's of the earth, to which you would ask the question, well, what city are they talking about? And then we are introduced to this place called Babylon. And over and over again, the Christians, the church, the saints are called to come out of Babylon to be a different kind of people in the world as we follow in the way of the slaughtered lamb. Now, this, I feel like this idea of come out of her, my people, might be the subtitle to the entire book. That as you look at all of what the book of Revelation is trying to encourage Christians to do is to recognize that in some way we exist in exile. That we have been overcome by a space that is not our own and that we live in the time awaiting for the promised future for God to establish his kingdom through Jesus Christ here on earth where we will rule and reign with God for all of eternity. But until then, we are foreigners in a strange land. Until then, the church does not exist as everybody else, but we recognize that we are exiles even in the midst of our own country, even in the midst of wherever we might live. And so you get this idea of how the church is struggling with just simply giving in and compromising to the world around her, especially when it comes to wealth. As a matter of fact, here's the challenge to Laodicea a little bit earlier in chapter 3. God says to the church of Laodicea, for you say, I am rich. I become wealthy and need nothing, and you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Therefore, we recognize that Babylon has an economic system that Christians are tempted to fit into. Babylon has a way, an ethic of economics that is different than the church's ethic of economics. And the question is, what is the difference? And do we see a difference? Because uh, truth be told, most of the pastors, churches, and gurus that talk about money do not talk about money from the New Testament, even if they call themselves Christians. You ever notice that? You ever notice the people like, they're, 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 they're talking about Christian stuff, and they're like, hey, you know, these Proverbs. Here's another Proverbs. Here's another problem. Here's a quote from the old, you know, but for some reason, do they ever talk about Jesus? You know, not really, because, you know, we'd have to confront with these ideas of a different kingdom economics. So here's what I mean by that, is we see Jesus talking about the rich man and Lazarus. And the rich man continued to walk by Lazarus, somebody in poverty, by his door every day. And we don't really talk about the rich man and Lazarus. We, we don't really talk about um, how Jesus says that you can either serve God or money, but you can't serve both. You know, we'd have to confront Jesus' sayings. If we actually had a kingdom economic, we'd have to confront Jesus who says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither wrath nor uh, moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. All of a sudden, that steps on the toes of the baby steps, if you know what I mean. You know, there's this idea of saying, like, when you amass more treasure, and yet, how do we talk about Jesus? Or how about this? The rich man who says in Jesus' parable, I will do this, he said. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all my grain and my goods there. Then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. 
And what do we do with Jesus' condemnation of that kind of economic system? What do we do when James says this? If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, stay warm, and be well fed, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith, if it does not have works, is dead by itself. What do you do with these kind of economic principles? Because it doesn't fit into our Babylonian understanding of economics. Or what about Acts chapter 2 where it says, Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. You see, these don't play very well into the Babylonian economic system. They don't preach very well to gather a crowd to say, here's how you get more. They don't talk very well to a church to try to make it fit into American 21st century society. They're uncomfortable. They confront us. And we have to ask the question, am I meeting the text on its own terms? Is it confronting me with my understanding of the world around me in such a way that I'm uncomfortable and I need to pursue a different kind of ethic. And so at the heart of Babylonian ethics, we see this one reality. At the heart of Babylonian ethics is this, acquire all you can. Acquire all you can. Babylonian economic principles do not care for the welfare of others. It doesn't care that people are made in the image of God. It doesn't care that it exploits other people made in the image of God. Babylonian economic principles cares about one thing, acquiring more, so that this, the phrase might be, all the money you can, all the power you can, save all you can for as long as you can so you can have all you can. That's the idea behind Babylonian economics. You see, and the thing about spirituality is that money, as we see in the Bible, is actually quite binary. It's either this or it's that. Jesus kind of lays it out to say, listen, either you're going to serve God or you're going to serve mammon. You're like, well, isn't there like a middle ground where I can serve me a little bit and like serve God a little bit and then like have my like nest egg? And, and what we recognize is the Bible talks about economics in very black and white terms to say either you are serving God or you are serving money. And so if you don't believe me, let's look at some of these descriptions of Babylon throughout uh, Revelation 17 and 18. Revelation chapter 17, 4, note the description. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet Adorned with gold, adorned with gold, jewels, and pearls, had a golden cup in her hand, filled with everything detestable, with the impurities of her prostitution. Revelation chapter 18, verse 9, the kings of the earth who have committed sexual immorality and shared her sensual and excessive ways will weep and mourn over her when they see the smoke from her burning. Revelation uh, 18, 11, listen to the description. Merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargo any longer of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, scarlet, fragrant wood products, uh, ivory, expensive wood, brass, iron, marble. And then at the end, it even says, enslaves human lives. Look at uh, verse, uh, chapter 18, verses 15 and 17. The great city dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, jewels, and pearls. How about 19? Woe to the great city where all those who have ships on the sea became rich from her wealth. Are you noticing a theme here that there is an economic reality behind Babylon, the great city? That money and power drive the realities behind Babylon. There was a, one scholar, Jacques Ellul, uh, and he has this, this uh, book called Money and Power. And in his book, Money and Power, he talks about Jesus, how he says you can either serve God or, and oftentimes our translations say money, but actually that's mammon. And the understanding that Jacques says, listen, you can either serve that this idea of mammon is actually a spiritual power. It's a spiritual force that wants our soul. And so when it comes to this understanding of money, what we recognize is that you can either serve God or you can serve the alternative power of mammon. That there is actually a power behind mammon seeking to drive humanity toward ends to exploit one another, oppress one another, amass resources from one another. That there's actually a spiritual power behind this that drives the economic practices of empire. And again and again, what we don't even realize is that this is the water that we're swimming in. This is the understanding of how we see money, because how else could we see money? And yet we continue to see this different ethic that is gifted to us in Scripture. You see, Jesus prayed in his prayer, give us today our daily bread, whereas we would pray, give us a bread factory and cheap labor. And the question is, 
do we begin to see money differently? You see, mammon actually becomes a power, a spiritual power over us. So there's this passage in, the, in Luke where Jesus is, confronts a rich young ruler. And the rich young ruler says, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus quotes a few of the commitments to him. And he says, I've done all of these since my youth. And Jesus says, yes, but you lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have. Give it to the poor and come and follow me. Now, for a lot of my life, the way that I understood that was almost like a works righteousness. It almost felt like Jesus was saying like, hey, if you want to be righteous by yourself, go and do this and then come and follow me. But Jacques Ellul in his book, I think gives an excellent point, which is to say that Jesus is not talking about how to be righteous before God. Jesus in that passage is talking about freedom. And he recognizes the rich man is enslaved by his riches. And in that moment when Jesus says, sell all that you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me, that he's actually offering this young man freedom, liberation from his captivity to the oppressive rule of mammon. And so we begin to recognize that there is an oppressive rule of mammon in your life, in my life, in our country, as we recognize that we are one of the wealthiest countries in the world as we continue to amass resources to ourselves. So I wonder, what are some indicators? Well, let's see if the text gives us some indicators of whether or not we are uh, beholden to a Babylonian economic. And so number one, uh, we can see if we are giving into Babylonian economics, if the rich get richer, while the poor get poorer. Here's what it says in our text. It says, it talks about those who have committed sexual immorality and share in her sensual and excessive ways. That's in the, N in the uh, CSB, but I think the NASB is a little bit more literal in this, and I think it hits the nail on the head a little better. It says, who committed acts of sexual immorality and lived luxuriously with her. And so note here that in this passage, there are three different laments at the end of chapter 18 of three different people groups who are lamenting the fall of Babylon. The first are the kings, those who are rich. And so note that they're lamenting the fall of the Babylon because they are the ones who are rich and ruling. Notice that the reality of Babylon is that it is decadent, it's opulent, it's excessive, it celebrates riches at any cost. Babylonian economics love to impress the rich and powerful, and it accumulates wealth with a few to the neglect of the many. In America, the top 10% of the richest own more than the bottom 90% combined. Well, maybe you'd just say, well, that's just capitalism. You know, get used to it. To which we'd have to ask the question, well, are we living in Babylonian economics as the church or do we live by a different economic system? When the rich get richer and the poor get poor, that's Babylonian economics. When we say that you get what you merit and if you work hard, you get more, that's Babylonian economics. You see, these kings, did they really work harder than the laborer? Or did they have money and power that allowed them to continue to amass more wealth? Does the single mom working three jobs to provide for her kids work less than the engineer or the senator? That so often we say, well, listen, if they only worked harder, to which I would say, have you been with a single mom working three jobs? I don't think there's anyone working harder. But it's Babylonian economics. When we live without a care to the poverty of the people around us, that's Babylonian economics because we simply say, I'm set. And if you'd get your act together, maybe you would too. And so Babylonian economics, according to the kings, these kings got richer and richer while the poor got poorer and poorer. And we begin to recognize in the Babylonian economic system around us and ingrained into us, look around and you'll see it. How about the second group of people who begin to mourn the fall of Babylon, the merchants? And we begin to recognize the second sign is that um, a sign of the Babylonian economics is the rich get what they want and the poor don't get what they need. So let's go ahead, and as we read this, and again, here's the thing. Um, I know that some people might think that I'm like against America. I'm not against America. If I was in Newfoundland, I'd be talking about Canada. If I were in uh, Russia, thank you, uh, I'd be probably a little bit more uh, subversive uh, about that because I'd be a little worried. Um, so I'm grateful that we get to talk about it the way we do, but what we recognize is I'm not talking to Russians. 
I'm not talking to those living in South Africa. I'm talking to Christians in 21st century America. And so it's just more recognizing that we're swimming in the sea around us. And so let's just take a moment and see if there's any crossover between the rich get what they want, the poor don't get what they need. And let's listen in to the way that it is described of what is happening to the wealth going to Rome and see if there's any similarities between the description of lists going to Rome and the description of lists coming to America. Verse 11, the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargo any longer. Cargo of gold, silver, jewels, and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet, all kinds of fragrant wood products, objects of ivory, objects of expensive wood, brass, iron, and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, and frankincense, wine, olive oil, fine flour, grain, cattle, sheep, horses, and carriages, and slaves, human lives. Anybody see, like if we went through with a highlighter, we just kind of asked the question, are there things that are coming over as cargo today? Where would there be crossover? These business owners are getting rich off of the exploitation of others, and the rich continue to get what they need while the poor don't. Notice that it's all luxurious objects that are being transported over to Rome, overlooking the needs of the poor. And what we recognize is that ultimately, the apex of recognizing Babylonian economics is found in the trading of human lives. You notice that? It says at the very end, enslaves human lives. America was built on Babylonian realities that we trafficked in human lives. And there are some who would like to cover over that or imagine that somehow America is not culpable for those sorts of things. But what we must recognize is where the text leads us to say that one of the marks of Babylon is the exploitation of people by slaves and human lives. We recognize that today there's an estimated 27 million people trafficked around the world. It's Babylonian economics. Notice in verse 14 that the merchants marketed in splendid and glamorous things. One translator uses the word dainties. It's the luxury items the rich desire while the impoverished go without food. iPhones, precious metals for economics, jewelry, clothing. Fruit here is explicitly mentioned as we see the exploitation of workers around us. As a matter of fact, there was just an article that came out to say that there's an exploitation of prisoners in the South where they're being paid pennies on a dollar to um, go about and to harvest uh, fruit for the rest of the United States. And uh, we recognize that's Babylonian economics. We begin to look at the world around us and see the spaces where all of a sudden, where the rich get what they want and the poor don't get what they need and we say, there's Babylon. Number three, we see uh, you might be living in a Babylonian economic system If at the fall of that system, the rich weep while the poor rejoice. You see, the shipmasters, the seafarers, the sailors weep at the destruction of Babylon. They say this, Woe, woe, the great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, adorned with jewels and gold and pearls. For in a single hour, such fabulous wealth was destroyed. She became rich from her wealth, for in a single hour she was destroyed. Again, it says in verse 19. And so we see this idea of asking the question, where are we seeing the rich weep while the poor rejoice? Because that might be the end of a Babylonian economic system. You see, as we begin to recognize that um, at the heart of Babylonian economics is not lazy people. I know it's like easier to like come up with this cognitive dissonance in my mind if I just say, well, like if they worked harder, then they would have more. But they're lazy and that's why they don't. And that's so often what we're indoctrinated with. But what we recognize is that's a Babylonian economic system. When we begin to recognize that poverty has social, psychological, governmental, individual realities, and instead of me trying to help myself sleep a little better at night so that I'm just saying, like, listen, if they tried harder, they would have more, then I'm not seeing Babylon for what it is, which is a space that, uh, that continues to exploit the people who are poor. And if we feel a little shifty in our seats, it might be because there's a lot of similarities between Babylonian economics and the economics that you and I grew up with. And that's not to say that any governmental system is somehow better. 
Like we tried communism, not better. Socialism, not better. Capitalism, still struggling. And so the problem is that you can't solve Babylonian economics through some sort of different economic system because you know what's at the core of what our economic system that is? Broken people. Mammon. You ever notice that like no matter who's in power, like the Democrats are like, we're going to change everything. And they get in power and they're like, but not here. You know, like they're, whatever happens, they're like, ah, you know, California's ours. And you're like, well, that's not going well. And like Republicans get in power, like we're going to fix the world. And like all of a sudden, like what happens, you know, like um, not fixing the world. And so no matter what happens, there will always be corruption because of money and power. And what we recognize is that these systems are not fixed by a better uh, monetary system, but they are corrected when the people of God live into the kingdom of God as the people of God, because the church is called to be a new humanity. If we truly believe what the Bible says, the Bible says that when you and I come to Christ, that we are given a new heart, and it's by that new heart that we're able to do things that other people cannot do. And yet I'm always disappointed that so often the world looks at the church and sees the corruption of church's ethics and economics and is disappointed as it points a finger at the church, can I say what a sad representation of what God calls us to be. When the world looks at the church and says, get your act together. But so often what ends up happening is that the economic system of acquire all you can becomes the ethic of the church. Isn't it more spiritual to have more? More buildings, more funds, more in our bank account, be able to drive in the best cars, best houses. Like, doesn't that witness well to the gospel of Jesus Christ? To which I would say, did Jesus drive around in the best? Or did he walk around in poverty? And so I asked the question, what water am I swimming in? How am I called to live differently? Because I remember that mammon is a power that seeks to enslave people to its clutches. So then, what is the solution? Well, I think that Jacques, in his book, actually gives a very good solution. He talks about this, make money profane. He says, desacralize money. Don't make it something that you are continuing to serve, but actually make it something different. Here's how he puts it, and I, I got to read the paragraph because I think it's so good. He puts it this way. He says, there is one act, par excellence, which profanes money by going directly against the law of money, an act for which money is not made. This act is giving. Money in the Christian life is made in order to be given away. We cannot measure the power of giving in human relations. Not only does it destroy the power of money, but even more, it introduces the one who receives the gift into the world of grace. And it begins a new chain of cause and effect, which breaks the vicious circle of selling and corruption. Alul is pointing to this idea of saying, when you begin to give generously, in such a way there's no quid pro quo, in such a way there's no this for that, we're inserting a different reality into this present moment to invite a different kingdom perspective to the world around us. And when we do that, all of a sudden, we drop the reality of the kingdom that you and I belong to, which is God's kingdom, into this present moment. And Babylonian economics cannot make sense of it because they're like, why are you generous? Why are you giving when you ask for nothing in return? And the reason why is we point to Christ and we say, because because it's in the very nature of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Notice here that the death of Jesus liberates us from the captivity to sin, death, hell, and mammon. Notice that Jesus talks about how he is the liberator, Nazareth Manifesto, that he will proclaim liberty to the captives. He's the, he's the liberator from those things that we've been empowered to. And the reality is that there can be no freedom except through Christ. You see, what kind of people would give things away for free? Nobody who doesn't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and recognize there is a life to come and we're living for that life, not simply for this life. It's those kinds of people who believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. What kind of people would lay down their arms and lay down their life for another person? 
I'll tell you, it's the kind of people who would say, not for this life only, but for the life to come. There's no other reason why Christians would live in this kind of way. That's why the world cannot live in this way, is because it's not coherent with their worldview. Because if you only have one life, then amass all that you can, unless you belong to a different world, unless you belong to a different kingdom, unless you truly believe that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection means your death, burial, and resurrection, and you and I are living into a different kind of kingdom. Those are the only kind of people who can live in this way. At times, I've thought about other cultures and how, like, even they were buried with their riches. You know, it's easy for me to look at, like, the Egyptians and be like, Neanderthals, you know, like they were buried with their riches. But honestly, they're way more cohesive in their worldview than we are. Because at least they thought, I can take it with me. So if I get buried with it, then I might as well take it with me. The thing about America is that we say, like, hey, there's nothing after this. We're atheists. But you know what we're going to do is we're going to spend our entire life amassing not gold, but ones and zeros. Binary code on a screen. We're going to spend our whole life amassing ones and zeros on a screen, and then we're going to give it away to people uh, or to the government as they take the money from us. And that, for me, seems way less coherent than at least the Egyptians were like, hey, at least we can take it with us. <laughs> but I recognize that so often the ones and zeros on a screen don't mean much. And Jesus is freedom from this. If we don't live generously, it's because we don't believe that there is a Father in heaven of abundance who will take care of us. We won't live generously if we don't believe in the gospel. And money is where the rubber hits the road to ask what we truly believe about this life and the next. Because apart from this trust in Jesus, there will be stingy finances in the church. So Jesus, um, the thing about Jesus is that, like, it's not very often where he would come in and actually, like, lower a standard. And so sometimes, you know, like, right now in the church, the gold standard of, like, if somebody's giving, they're like, wow, you're a big giver. Normally that number is uh, 10%. That's called the tithe. You'll hear that oftentimes. And so in the Old Testament, uh, that tithe would normally go to the Levitical priesthood. It would go to upkeep of all those kind of realities. And so oftentimes, like, you talk to pastors, and, like, they start talking about the tithe, and they're like, wow, that person's tithing. As a matter of fact, only about 2% uh, tithe right now who go to churches. Um, what's interesting to me is when did Jesus ever lower the ethic of the Old Testament? Like Jesus shows up on the scene and he says, listen, uh, you know, you know that it was said don't murder, but um, just kill whoever you want, you know? He said, you know, don't murder, but if you're angry with somebody in your heart, you've already committed murder in your heart. Jesus says, you've heard it said don't commit adultery, but if you lust, you commit adultery in your heart. So since when did Jesus lower the ethic so the church begins to be so stingy that 10% seems like an astronomical goal? And when do pastors get to get up and they get to talk about giving and manipulate people using Old Testament texts so that those preachers can get rich and so that buildings can get bigger? Who do you think you are? The idea behind kingdom economics is not so that churches can get bigger and more wealthy and have bigger buildings and bigger budgets. The idea behind kingdom economics is to give to those who are poor because it's a picture of the kingdom of heaven where Christ came down to us because though he was rich, he became poor for our sake though that we might be able to become rich. And so it's the call of the church, not simply to amass a bunch of riches and to stop being stingy kind of people, but to actually give to the world around us. Let me tell you, I'm not looking to line the coffers of Movement Church. You want to know what I will do if Movement Church can no longer pay me? I will do my best to preach every weekend while working another job. It is fine. I'm not looking to line the coffers of Movement Church. I'm not looking for a bigger building for Movement Church. As a matter of fact, there's few times in Scripture, actually, where giving is specifically toward a church or toward leadership. There's a couple of times we see where somebody would sell a field and they would lay down at the apostles' feet that amount of money. Uh, we see in 1 Timothy where it says, don't, tread the, don't muzzle the ox while it treads the grain. And so there's a couple of instances, but by and large, what I want you to hear me say is not that I want to, you to give to movement. What I want you to hear me say is I want you to give in such a way that 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 14 might be true. He says this, at the present time, your surplus is available for their need so that their abundance may in turn meet your need in order 
that there may be equality. I feel like the moment that we bring up equality, people start freaking out. But we have to deal with the text. The text is saying that there will be Christians that sometimes have a lot, and there will be Christians who sometimes have a little, and it is the call and demonstration of the kingdom of God that when you have a lot, you give to those who have a little, and when somebody else has a lot, they give to those who have a little. Can you imagine this kind of idea? That when we talk about this idea of being marked with the beast or sealed with the Holy Spirit, that it is as obvious as on your forehead or in your hand. And the question is, what are you thinking about? What are you giving to? What is in your hand? What are the things that you are dwelling on? And it's so often that the church's hand, you can't see the seal on it because it's so gripped around stinking finances. And I see my own heart and I see it gripped around my finances. And so we're called the church must come out of Babylon. And so in difference to Babylonian ethic that says acquire all you can, a kingdom ethic says give all you can. A kingdom ethic says give all you can. And I'm not, I'm just frustrated that I wish somebody would have told me this sooner. I wish somebody would have talked to me about this sooner. I wish somebody, because I think for so much of my life I was gripping onto it so hard and the liberation through Jesus Christ is so different and so I'm just I'm grateful for this but it's a message that I think is so important because I don't hear it very often but here's the message that we see what is the difference between Babylonian economics and kingdom economics kingdom economics come from give all you can second Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9 let's draw some applications from it uh first we recognize that we're called to give graciously in this passage it says for you know the grace what we recognize is that grace is not a quid pro quo Grace is not a, if you do this for me, I'll do this for you. Grace is giving. Giving without expectation. I think God knew that when he gave his son, that he gave knowing there would be people who would mistreat that. Knowing there would be people who abuse that. And if that is true, then in our generosity, then people will misuse and abuse our generosity. And yet, we see that we're called to give graciously. Another quote from Alul, he says this, the Bible strongly reminds us of this by never distinguishing between those who are worthy of receiving gifts and those who are unworthy. The Bible speaks of the needy, those who lack the essentials of life. When we hear this appeal, we do not have to calculate if the, purpose, if the person is needy by his own fault or by bad luck. If he merits our gift or not, these calculations belong to mammon. They change, they change giving into the restricted charity practiced by bad men of goodwill. The offering, the moment of giving, should be for us the moment when we desacralize the world and show our consecration to the Lord. And so it is our calling to give graciously. And as we give, we recognize that it's almost more of a gift to us than it is to them. Because if I see rightly that mammon wants my soul and that liberation comes through generosity, then that means that my being generous liberates my soul and it's more about the liberation of me than it is somehow solving them. Number two, give sacrificially. It says, though he was rich, for your sake he became poor. And we recognize that Jesus' sacrifice was something that cost him. We recognize that you and I are called to side with humanity over money. That we're called to help to those around us over simply amassing wealth. And so the question that I ask myself is, when has giving hurt me? When have I not bought something because I gave instead? When did I forego the car? When did I forego the 401k? When did I forego the watch? When did I forego the upgrade for the sake of generosity? And if I can't think of a time in my mind, then maybe I'm not being generous. Because for me to give sacrificially means that there's things on my list that I would say in and of my own heart, I would imagine that this thing would make me happy. And what I'm doing is I'm crossing that out and I'm remembering that that will not make me happy. It will enslave me to an old way of life. And instead, liberation comes to the work of Jesus Christ. And so giving sacrificially is a reminder of the work of Jesus. Number three, give personally. It says, so that by his poverty, you might become rich. That to every person, Jesus gives of himself. And we recognize that we become rich because of Jesus' personal giving to us. And so it's one thing to give to an organization that just says like, hey, go do something good with my money. It's a very different thing to give to individuals and to meet an individual in their need. And over and over again in the Bible, what we see is this call for the economics to, to meet the need of individuals so that in this church, the, the prayer is that there would not be a single hungry person among us 
there would not be a single person among us who would not be able to get gas from here, from their house to church and back. The prayer would be that there would be um, people who would be giving to those around them personally to be able to display the kingdom of God among us and around us. And there have been moments where this has beautifully happened. There have been moments where in small groups, there's been a pause and saying, instead of just praying for this, why don't we do something about it? Where pocketbooks books were, were pulled out and where actually people were served. And that's the call. I'm not asking you to give a bunch of money to Movement Church. I'm asking you to give money to one another, to know each other well enough, to know the struggles of what's happening well enough, to be in tune enough with one another that we are responsible to each other that we can give personally. And then lastly, that we are called to give for equality. That we recognize that though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, that by his poverty you might become rich. Do you notice that there is this desire for equality? that he who is rich became poor so that he who is poor might become rich. And so once again, we see this principle playing itself out. We see other portions of scripture where again, we see that this is the desired vision. And maybe we don't totally see it on this side of eternity, but maybe we can work toward this end. I don't know where this leads. I'm swimming in water that I don't even understand. I'm trying to come to scripture and ask myself the question, if Babylon has a certain economic reality and the church has a different one, then how in the world do I live differently following the slaughtered lamb? And so there's a lot of areas in my life. I don't have like a cute application for you to say, here's what you need to go do. Uh, it's praying and asking and seeing, have I become captive to a Babylonian economic? And can I begin to dwell on the work of Jesus Christ? to become a different kind of person? And can I hear the call that God gives to me when he says, come out of her, my people? My prayer is that we as a church might hear, come out of her, my people, and that we might be those kind of people. And so um, there's maybe individual application and there's group application. Uh, we do prayer once a month uh, and kind of a little bit of a teaching once a month here at the church. And next month in July, uh, I would love for us to get together. And as a matter of practicing this, um, we're just gonna take some money out of some of the, the buffer that we have at Movement. And uh, I don't know how much it's gonna be yet. Maybe $1,000, maybe $2,000, but we're gonna get together and we're just gonna pray. And we're gonna say, God, uh, who do you want us to bless with this money? Not like give it away to some organization, but like physically, who do you want us to bless? To come together, to pray, to intercede, and to think about ways that we can be generous and to recognize that toward a God who has been generous toward us, the way that we continue to show a kingdom ethic is by simply saying, here's generosity filled with grace. Do with it what you might. Now you might spend it in ways that I might not, but that's not up to me. And so as a church, all I can say is what we're going to try to do is to live this kind of life, to say that we're not going to simply amass for ourselves resources, but we're gonna to seek to give those resources away so that the kingdom of God might continue to grow and expand among us because we are those who follow in the way of the slaughtered lamb. And so if you'd like to come and be a part of that, we'd love to have you. Uh, we'll continue to update you in the church email. Um, but the next time that we meet up, I need to discuss with our developing elders what they're praying through and how much that's gonna be. Uh, but we'll give away as much as we can. Uh, and so would you stand with me this morning? Lord, I pray, that, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work beyond my capacity. That Lord, by my flesh and by my ignorance, that this message could come across as angry or it could come across as condescending. And Lord, that is not at all my heart. I pray that this message would be a message of liberation, that it would be a message of hope, that it would be a message that reminds us that we can be a different kind of people in the world to give our lives self-sacrificially for the sake of others. And so I pray, Lord, that you would do that. I pray that the words come out of her, my people, would be true of us, that those who follow after the slain lamb would recognize our opportunities to be able to give generously to the world around us, to recognize the spaces where we've given in to different ways of being and that, Lord, we might follow after you. Lord, I thank you that your word will not return to you void and that your word um, works faith in us and that faith works. And so, Lord, um, I thank you for your grace and for your mercy. I pray, Lord, that you would develop here for your people 
a kingdom kind of people who would live differently in the world. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. I do confess I am imperfect and that um, I, I hope that my passion does not come across as anger. I hope that my passion and desire for change does not come across as anything else but love because I care about you guys. I care about the kingdom of God and I desperately wanna see him work among us. And so um, forgive me if I've offended uh, by not addressing the way that I should have, um, but know that my heart is desiring to see God's kingdom dwell among us. Um, and so with that, uh, the Lord um, with his disciples in the upper room, he sent them out as ambassadors. He sent them out as kingdom citizens. And uh, so we send you out in the same way. And so Jesus said, peace be with you as the Father sent me, I am sending you. Uh, Ellie's just gonna play and sing one more song. Uh, feel free to stay around and worship or feel free to, uh, to head home. But blessings in Jesus Christ. Thank you for being here this weekend. And we're grateful for our time to worship together.